Hi, I'm Dr. Len Calabrese from the R.J. Fazenmayer Center for Clinical Immunology. And it's my pleasure to present to you Chapter 4 on T-cell effector function, Part 1. As a result of participating in this, you should be able to differentiate Th1 and Th2 responses and be able to define them. You should be able to identify the signature cytokines from these cells and also recognize examples of Th1 and Th2 polarization in infections, autoimmune diseases, and allergic diseases. And finally, you should be able to describe some of the fundamental roles of CTLs, or CD8 cytotoxic lymphocytes, in health and disease. So let's start our discussion today with the case of two women. This is Ursula. She's 18 years old. She's from an African village. And on the, on the right, you can see this hypopigmented lesion on her arm. It's fairly asymptomatic, but it is expanding. So she goes to the regional clinic, and they're pretty smart. They recognize this very early on. They perform a biopsy. The biopsy shows these rich granulomas. Because of the epidemiology of the area, they are stained for mycobacterium leprae, and no organisms are seen. Yet clinically, they recognize this as a form of leprosy. She's treated with antimicrobials, and gradually this totally heals. This is Nimona. She's from the same village. She has a different problem, radically different problem. You can see these plaques that extend over her arms and varying parts of her body. Over a period of many, many months, she also has developed um, sensory nerve changings, particularly in the hands and arms, and now has flexion contractures of the fourth and fifth digits on each side. She goes to the regional clinic, and they recognize this as probably the same type of problem. You know, she's from the same village, probably the same type of organism, maybe even the same uh, clone of organism, yet a remarkably different story. She is biopsied, and what they have identified here are lesions teeming with mycobacterium leprae. She's put on combination antimicrobial therapy, and over many months, these lesions regress, but she's left with fixed neuropathy. Two women, one infection, but two dramatically different immunopathologies. Over the next few minutes, I'm going to explain to you how this occurs. As with all of our cases and lectures, we'll be using two textbooks by Garland Science, the Immune System by Peter Parham, and Janeway's Immunobiology. I've identified the highlighted chapters for you to follow along, particularly if you want greater detail. So in my first lecture, I showed you this figure. Walking along on the sunny day, snagging my hand on the rusty nail, and having to mobilize the immune response. We've learned a lot since that first lecture. And this uh, threat, this danger signal, uh, penetrated the first line of defense, our integuments. It overwhelmed the innate immune response. And now, weeks later, the adaptive immune response is coming uh, to the rescue. How does this occur? Well, within the integument, there are cells of the innate immune response. And here I'm showing a dendritic cell. In the skin, this might be considered a longer Han dendritic cell. It is kind of collecting uh, intelligence on the battlefield. Since the innate immune response was incapable of ridding the microbes, the dendritic cell, which is highly armed with a variety of receptors of the innate immune system, internalizes these microbes and starts to uh, generate an antigen presentation uh, uh, metabolic pathway. Early on in the life of a dendritic cell, it is highly phagocytic, tolerogenic, as it starts to perform its task of metabolizing antigen, getting ready for antigen presentation, it becomes more mobile, and it actually changes the way it looks and the way it behaves. You can see it is headed toward a regional lymph node. And what's it going to be doing there? Well, at the same time that the dendritic cell is bringing back battlefield information on the invading pathogens, naive T cells that Dr. Rigby talked to you about are scanning lymph nodes on a daily basis. So that what are they scanning for? They're looking for their cognate antigen. They're looking for 
that specific foreign danger signal that they were born to recognize. And it is now being brought to them by this dendritic cell. So within the context of the secondary lymphoid organ, this lymph node, we'll start to generate the adaptive immune response. So let's take a look at this adaptive immune system. I like to start at 30,000 feet. So consider adaptive immunity, which now triggers after four or five days, as consisting of either cellular or humoral immunity or both. Humoral immunity will be covered later. We understand that. We're going to generate antibodies, memory cells. This is pretty uh, straightforward. Cell-mediated immunity, on the other hand, is differentiated into a variety of different types of T-cell responses. It's not just delayed hypersensitivity. We can have CTLs, cytotoxic lymphocytes, which I'll talk about in a few minutes, which are designed to kill. We also have many other types of effectors. And today we're going to focus on the Th1 and Th2 responses. Dr. Plevy, in subsequent chapter, will talk about the Th17 response. So let's get right down to it. One of the interesting and remarkable things about adaptive immunity, uh, particularly cell-mediated immunity, is that we start out with a naive T cell. The naive T cell has certain characteristics, both in the way it appears and the way it behaves. Here we have a number of receptors festooning this uh, T cell. We see IL-7, which is a growth factor receptor to allow it to proliferate. We see, of course, the uh, T cell receptor complex uh, with CD3. We also see a couple other receptors for CD62L, which allows it to scan those lymph nodes looking for its cognate antigen, and CCR7, a chemokine receptor, uh, uh, which helps it traffic its way along through the body. So if all these T cells are naive and they can differentiate into all these different pathways, how does it do it? Well, here's just some examples. I'm showing you Th1 on the top, which as I will try to make my point, leads to macrophage activation. I'm showing you Th2 secreting another family of cytokines, leading to the augmentation and stimulation of humoral immunity. I'm showing the T cell secreting IL-2, which used to be called T cell growth factor which can augment the cytotoxic lymphocyte response. And finally, again, we're going to hear much more about Th17 cells, uh, which are integral in the immunopathology of a growing number of conditions. So let's go back to Th1 and Th2. This is really a concept that has uh, only been with us about 25 years. Mossman and colleagues at that time recognized that in murine systems, T cells could be polarized to behave differently to secrete different types of cytokines. It was initially hoped that these could be identified phenotypically. In other words, you could do flow cytometry and count them, enumerate them. Unfortunately, that was uh, uh, wishful thinking. T cells are somewhat plastic. This is a term that is used a lot in contemporary immunology, meaning they can go between one form and another. And this is uh, one of the uh, characteristics of these types of cells. At a high altitude view, the naive T cell is stimulated by its cognate antigen. It depends upon what type of antigen it is, what the concentration of that antigen is, what type of danger signal it is, what is the milieu, what is the cytokine milieu. All of these things may contribute to whether it becomes polarized as a Th1 cell or a Th2 cell. As you can see, there are many different characteristics of these Th1 cells and Th2 cells. And if you try to create a laundry list in your brain, of all the different physiochemical properties, phenotypic properties, cytokine profiling, it'll be difficult to remember. So let me break it down for you in a more palatable way. This slide shows the cytokines that are produced, some of the receptors on the cell surface, um, some of the uh, uh, roles that it has in humoral immunity and macrophage activation. If you remember just two things about this, Th1, Th2 paradigm. Remember this. The signature cytokine of a Th1 cell is gamma interferon. The signature cytokine of a Th2 type of response is IL-4. Everything else flows from there. It used to be thought that Th2 were only antibodies and Th1 were cell. That is a, a faux differentiation and overly simplistic. 
TH1s also participate in humoral immunity augmentation, just different types of antibody response. TH1s activate macrophages classically through the cytokine gamma interferon. TH2 can activate macrophages through an alternative pathway, and we'll come to that a bit later as well. So remember, what are the signature cytokines of Th1 and Th2? Th1, gamma interferon. Th2, IL-4. So if we can polarize these cells to become Th1 or Th2, another thing that is happening at the same time is they are going from a resting to an activated state. In the literature, we read all the time about determining the state of T cell activation or immune activation. There are many different barometers for this. Uh, there are soluble barometers, things such as cytokine levels and uh, acute phase reactants, but there are also cell barometers. And here we can see the resting and the activated uh, T cell. Um, this is showing a difference in certain types of membrane receptors. Here you can see things such as CD45RA. You see this in the literature all the time. This is called the common leukocyte antigen and different uh, types of post-translational modification of CD45 will either be RA or RO. RA is a naive cell. RO is a memory cell. We also can see an upregulation of a variety of adhesion molecules, which will affect trafficking. Note that not all cell surface receptors are modulated in activity and rest. CD4 and the T cell receptor are invariant. So let's summarize. Resting cell uh, is generated to, to be a naive cell. Uh, once it is tweaked, it can often go on to become a memory cell. During this process, you'll see upregulation of certain um, uh, T cell activation markers, such as MHC class 2, uh, a change in uh, cell surface uh, trafficking related molecules to allow it to get to where it needs to go and others. An important concept, you'll see it in the literature, you'll come back to it. So here we have a Th1 cell. Remember, gamma interferon. Gamma interferon leads to the activation of macrophages. On the left, we see the biopsy of Mycobacterium leprae. We would classify this as an opportunistic intracellular pathogen. Like tuberculosis, it can be engulfed by macrophages, but it survives within the cytoplasm, within vesiculated structures. So our body needs a different type of defense for this. As we all can remember from medical school, the granuloma is one of our primary modes of defense for opportunistic intracellular pathogens. The granulomas form this arcade of epithelial cells uh, around this core of more histiocytic type of cells to wall off an infection. Th1, gamma interferon, is integral to this. So you need CD4 cells uh, to make a granuloma. Once this Th1 cell is activated, here you can see a list of different types of biologic activities, ranging from the production of inflammatory cytokines to the activation of macrophages to altering um, uh, uh, T cell trafficking and inflammatory cell trafficking. Um, and the generation of growth factors to expand that immune response. Here we see not only the diagram, but we see the rich granuloma that we saw in our first patient, Ursula, uh, with the granulomas in her arm. Now, coming back up to 30,000 feet, I don't want to leave the impression that cell-mediated immunity are only CD4 cells. They're also CD8 cells and these are known as cytotoxic lymphocytes, or CTLs. You can see some of the characteristics um, on this uh, chart under CTLs, but when we think of them, what are they responding to? Well, they're responding to antigens that are being presented uh, in the context of class 1 MHC. We generally think that we need CTLs for viral infections, where pathogens are occupying the cytosolic space of these cells. Once triggered, with appropriate help from a CD4 cell with uh, growth factors to expand their presence, the killer T cell 
can light from infected cell to infected cell to infected cell, causing cell death of that infected cell. This can be beneficial to the host, obviously, because it can rid reservoirs of infection, also can be detrimental. I'll give you one example, hepatitis B. Hepatitis B virus is hepatotropic. It grows in these cells um, uh, but does not kill them. Only when the integrated immune response mounts a brisk CTL response do we get uh, varying degrees of hepatocellular damage, in other words, hepatitis. There are varying contents of CTLs, uh, such as perforin and granzyme, that participate in this. I urge you to go back to our textbooks to read for greater detail. This is the flow of cytotoxic lymphocytes, and this is going to become very much more important when we talk about the uh, immune response to malignancy. Here we see the naive T cell being tweaked by its cognate antigen. Over a period of 10 days, in the presence of interleukin-2, we can grow this rich uh, CTL response. And what happens to those cells? They do their job and they die. They have to die, or we would all develop lymphoproliferative diseases every time we developed an infection. They're under the influence of certain uh, growth factors, but they also uh, can self-renew. When we're challenged by certain types of viral infections that I call chronic replicative pathogens, in other words, not like influenza, you get it, you eject it from your body in a week or two, things like HIV and hepatitis C are replicating each and every day, every several hours. The immune system is constantly challenged by this. Those CTLs, after a time, don't function quite as well, and they lead to another phenomena that we call immunologic exhaustion. This is not energy. It's differentiated um, uh, uh, at the uh, genomic level, um, but these cells are dysfunctional. They don't proliferate as well. Um, uh, they have different cytokine profiles. And as we will see in chronic viral infections and cancer, the exhausted T cell is an obstacle that is now, for the first time, being overcome. This is very, very exciting data come back for our appropriate chapter and our working case on this. So let's uh, come back to our two women. Here we see the granulomatous reaction here of tuberculous leprosy, uh, a very self-limited lesion uh, that is totally cured by antimicrobials. Here we see a different clinical picture, the same pathogen but different pathology. No granulomas here, just a lot of mycobacterium leprae and a lot of tissue damage despite successful antimicrobial treatment. How does this happen? Well, the answer is here on this slide. Two different types of immunopathology. On the left, uh, we see the tuberculous uh, mycobacterial response, tuberculous leprosy. This is rich in granulomas. Remember what was required for granulomas? Th1 cells. On the right, we see a different picture, no granulomas. We don't have Th1 cells, but these patients are characterized by hypergammaglobulinemia. Here's the answer shown in gels. Remember what I told you about how to differentiate Th1 and Th2? Th1 signature cytokine, gamma interferon. Th2 cytokine signature, interleukin-4. As you can see, in the tuberculous lesions, you're harvesting uh, copious quantities of gamma interferon. And in the leporomatous lesion, you're harvesting copious quantities of interleukin-4. So now we've explained the differences in the clinical response between these two women. How did this happen with the same organism? Different genetic makeup of the host, perhaps a different um, uh, inoculum, uh, a variety of things that are answers uh, that we will be looking for in the years ahead. So finally, let me close with one other syndrome which kind of comes back to our take-home message today. This is a very, very current uh, uh, work uh, by the uh, group from Jean-Laurent Casanova. This is called Mendelian Susceptibility to Mycobacterial Disease. This has been known for about 50 years. What this is is a BCG response. Instead of being highly localized, certain people will develop disseminated BCG after being given this attenuated mycobacterium. Well, this occurs on a familial basis. 
Um, and in people who develop this, they're also susceptible to certain other types of problems, such as uh, severe TB and other opportunistic intracellular pathogens, such as salmonella. We now know that there are a handful of uh, genetic defects uh, of uh, the integrated immune response that lead to this. And I'm highlighting just two of them for you because this will have a great take home message. The first one are defects in the interferon gamma receptor. And remember, gamma interferon is the signature cytokine of Th1. Kind of makes some sense. The other is the P40 component of the IL-12, IL-23 cytokine system. Let's uh, drill into this a little bit. So within the uh, IL-12, IL-23 system, these are cytokines which generate the milieu which is required for Th1 response. So when we have defects of IL-12, um, we will have a, an attenuated Th1 response. So collectively, now what do we have? In this Mendelian susceptibility syndrome, we have defects of gamma interferon, we have defects of IL-12. In other words, we have defects of Th1, we have defects of granuloma production, and these people cannot contain opportunistic intracellular pathogens. So in conclusion, we've talked about this naive T cell uh, capacity to differentiate into different types of effectors. Remember, they are plastic. Once activated, they go from this naive resting state to this active memory state. We've talked about how to differentiate Th1 and Th2, gamma interferon, the signature cytokine of Th1, interleukin-4, the signature cytokine of Th2. And finally, we've come back with some clinical correlations in infectious disease, autoimmune disease, and immunodeficiency disease. It's been my pleasure to participate in this uh, chapter of our course. I encourage you to come back and join us for the rest.